safe streets, vibrant neighborhoods, successful business and commerce. These are things that make a healthy community. We are a diverse community, rural, suburban, urban, a multitude of languages and ethnicities, ages and experiences. We are a collaborative community. Public-private partnerships make us a model community that others want to follow. It is what makes us unique. It is what makes us strong. The employees of Kent County reflect our diversity and seek to serve our communities. People in this county, in this area, we wrap our arms around each other. We come together to collaborate, to solve problems. Um, we're all working for the good of the whole. And I think that's wonderful. And you can see it. You can see it as you drive around Kent County. Our impact starts the day a baby is born and a birth certificate is issued, to protecting children from deadly diseases through vaccination, to the public safety and justice provided by law enforcement and the courts, to offering veteran services and caring for the elderly. Every day we work to keep our communities robust. I think if you are somebody who is interested in serving your community, in building a strong knowledge base and a good group of people to work with, then the county is one of your best employment opportunities out there. It's been completely rewarding in every way I could possibly explain for 26 years and I feel like I grow every single day still today. Leading these dedicated employees are 19 member Board of Commissioners and our County Administrator Controller, along with our elected officials and appointed department directors, placing emphasis on civic involvement, quality housing, vibrant neighborhoods, and strong, solid infrastructure to allow businesses to thrive. Professional, dedicated, collaborative, and innovative. Behind the scenes, collaboration between foundations, charitable organizations, nonprofits, for-profit businesses, public sector demonstrated through the county, the city of Grand Rapids, the townships, all the cities and the villages in our area. If we don't come together, then we will not have the strength that we have today, and I only hope to build upon that. Our aim is to make our communities the best they can be. We are involved in exciting development projects, sustainable recycling programs, and creative progressive prevention programming. We partner with elected officials, impacting policy ideas that become great achievements. We seek opportunities to reach out into the community and offer our services to help our residents make Kent County thrive. Our relationship um, is solid, um, both from a staff standpoint at the county level as well as the Board of Commissioners and um, they understand what we do and the benefits that we can do for the community and vice versa, we couldn't do what we do without the help of Kent County. While most of us are busy running our lives, Kent County's elected officials, administrator controller, and over 1,600 employees are serving the communities where we live our lives so we can all have a place we are proud to call home. Kent County, it's life well run. Good morning. I'd like to open up our Legislative and Human Resources Committee today for Tuesday, April 25th. Do I have any public comment today? Thank you. All right, seeing none, can I get a motion for the minutes? So moved. Support. <laughs> I, move to post post I move to postpone. Can I get a second? Second. No, All right, any discussion on the minutes? There was a, there was a motion that on a resolution that was made incorrectly. It was made supposedly by me and I didn't make that, so I want to postpone it to get it corrected. Okay. We'll just postpone it until our next meeting. Got it. Once they're changed. So we can watch the TV and figure out who made the motion. Got it. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All right, moving on to <laughs> item three, legislative update. Becky Beckler, PAA. Uh, the legislature returned last week after a two-week spring recess and quickly resumed their work on the budget process. Um, Just move the microphone closer. Just move the microphone closer. There we go. <laughs> uh, which the goal is still to get the budget done by mid-June, if not earlier. 
Uh, I know there were earlier conversations among some House members that perhaps they wanted to spend the entire summer working on the budget, but both leaders quickly dismissed that, as well as the governor saying, no, we want to stay with our original goal of getting this budget completed by early June. So the last few subcommittees uh, met last week. They were significant to the county, uh, dealing with the health and human services budget, as well as the general government. In the House, there was good news uh, in the human services budget in that there was boilerplate included, which would allow Kent County to pilot behavioral and health uh, services model, an integrated service model that's uh, important to the county. We had a very good meeting with our delegation, our Senate delegation yesterday, and we anticipate that similar boilerplate will be added in the Senate. It could be added as soon as tomorrow when the full appropriations committee takes that bill up. Uh, but that was an important, uh, I think, sign from the department as well as the House that this is something that the legislature would like to move towards. So we look forward to that. Um, in the Senate, uh, there, while there were a lot of cuts, there was one restoration from the governor's recommendation. That was an $8 million administrative fee that goes to counties for the child care fund. If you'll recall, about uh, a year and a half ago, Representative Pileski introduced some legislation that would hold the counties harmless should the foster care uh, community get an increase for the child care fund and this would restore that that commitment to hold the county harmless uh, there were some increases uh, unfortunately because the both the house and the Senate are about cutting the budget some of those increases were reduced but it's good that they restored the county uh, so that they're on a cut to that we'll continue to monitor that to make sure that the house concurs with that because we I, I think that's an important component to, for the county um, on the general government side is with regard to, to uh, revenue sharing the House uh, concurred with what the governor had recommended, which was no cut. The Senate gave a 1% increase to county revenue sharing. Uh, we are hopeful that we can maintain that. Um, however, there was, as a, as a cost reduction, there was no deposit into the budget stabilization fund from the Senate. That's a $175 million cut from the governor's recommendation. They also recommended um, removing a, a, over 800 uh, FTEs from the budget. So there's some significant reductions. The overall goal for the Senate and the House was to cut over $200 million from the governor's budget. Uh, that was not done without some forethought. Uh, the House, as you know, has been very focused on trying to come up with a way to cut the income tax. The Senate, however, is in a little bit of a different camp. Their Senate, the Senate Republican Caucus is divided into three camps, if you will. You have those that want to do an income tax cut, you have those that want to put that savings toward infrastructure, and you have some that would like to pay down debt. And so they are yet unresolved on where they would like to focus that attention. But clearly, having uh, the Senate and the House cut the governor's budget by over $2 million, that will force a conversation of what to do with those savings. The Senate this week is going to start conversations. I, I'm not convinced they're going to actually do anything other than have caucus conversations about the state, uh, the state education and retirement system, MEPSERS. The Senate Majority Leader believes that that $20 million and growing, $29 billion and growing debt is something that the state needs to look at, and they need to look at sooner versus later. So that is his priority, and he's going to start those conversations in the Senate this week. I don't think it'll come in the form of any type of action. It may be a bill introduction. It may simply be a caucus conversation. But that is something that they plan to do um, and start those conversations. So. That really is my report. Other than budgets um, and the full House approves and Senate approves are taking up those budgets this week, there really is very little else that's going on in the legislature other than full focus on the budget completion. Thank you, Becky. Any questions for Becky today? Mr. Bukowski. Um, thank you. Um, with the um, proposed $200 million in cuts in the House and the Senate, um, how similar are those cuts? And and then how committed would the governor be to saying he, he does not want those cuts because since he proposed that spending. So, you know, again, I, at least a couple of those items they would like to put that savings to, um, I would like to support. Um, however, how realistic will it be to actually achieve that? That's an excellent question. The cuts from both the Senate and the House perspective are very different. Um, if you just look at the Health and Human Services budget, and both of, both of those budgets were cut over $100 million. For the House, they took a lot of what the governor had recommended and simply pared those back. Any increase the governor uh, proposed, there was a lot of paring down. For the Senate, it was a little differently. They actually cut more significantly. So it's very different 
program to program as well as subcommittee to subcommittee like uh, the general government and revenue sharing um, they just have a very different vision of how to make those cuts I know that there was a struggle within the Senate Republican caucus they believed they were cutting too much uh, Senator Marlowe was very aggressive about the fact that he felt he had been required he had actually at the beginning had been asked to cut 124 million dollars but he just couldn't get there uh, and told his caucus that he couldn't get there so there's extreme differences on how they made those cuts uh, how the governor will handle uh, this is still yet to be known he's been very quiet about how they want to uh, proceed with the with the budget which is which is typical of this government he, he allows the Senate and the House to make their recommendations but there clearly is a sign of both sides that they want to do something so it's most likely that something will have to happen either on the debt or the income tax um, they're gonna have to do something because they've shown that that's a willingness of the House and the Senate whether it's an aggressive 200 million dollar cut is still a conversation that still needs to be had amongst the three parties so I think that's an unknown answer to that question all right thank you Thank you, Becky. Uh, Commissioner Ponstein. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Becky, just quick, when you say the word pay down debt, what are the big ticket items that need to be paid down yet? Um, like well, the top two? Clearly, MESPERS is one of them, that, uh, the public teachers. Um, I think the, um, the debt for municipalities is also of a concern to the Senate Majority Leader, if you remember in the lame duck session last year. I think the House uh, made a short attempt at doing that. Um, infrastructure debt would probably be um, down the road for that. But those are the three that most often come up in the legislature, mostly in the Senate, I'll be honest with you. The House is fully focused on the income tax from the leadership perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Stett. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Becky. Good morning. Uh, one of the uh, things that was chatted about a little bit uh, in the meeting yesterday, and by the way, thank you for being there. Absolutely. Um, was the uh, adjustments on the direct care wage. Yes. Uh, and there's a difference between all three, between the governor and the House and the Senate on that. Um, one of the things I was a little concerned about suggesting in that conversation that they're not fixing it on either the House proposal or the Senate proposal. It's about a $50 million tag. Is that gonna go away as a solution here, just on the basis that we're not doing any good anyway, so we might as well just drop the money? That was a concerning conversation that what would the 50, 50 cent increase do? Um, so I think that's a conversation that the governor is probably going to be very strong on as well as the, uh, the community that, that it serves um, because that is something that the governor as well as the lieutenant governor are pretty strong about that they need to, that is a core value of trying to increase care and you do that by increasing the quality of care and, and mm -hmm. the, the type of employee that you get. So I was a little concerned, I caught that as well, that there, that, that might be set aside. Um, but I think the governor's probably going to respond pretty strongly uh, in response to that. But that, again, is it, those are all conversations that still have to be played out amongst the House and the Senate and the governor's office. Um, I can try to do some intelligence gathering from the governor's office to see how hard they're gonna push back, just so we have a sense of that. But at this point, he's been fairly quiet about uh, what he's gonna fight more, more hard, hard on than others. Yeah. Well, thank you for catching that. Yeah. I, I was concerned that the way it came out, it was this is going to be an easy fix for $50 million or whatever. Yeah, kind of a throwaway, if you will. So, yes. Commissioner Brady. Thank you. Um, Becky, have there been any cuts uh, mentioned that would be related to our legislative priorities? Um, to our legislative priorities? I think there are some that haven't been included. I know we had talked about, or we were hopeful that in the corrections budget, we would have some language that dealt with the 17-year-olds being served as adults. Senator Prose uh, did not include that, so we're setting up a meeting with him. Maybe that's something that we do outside of the appropriations process. Um, he is the corrections person in the Senate. We did have a meeting with Senator Jones, and uh, while he's supportive, he didn't want to take this on, but I think Senator Prose might have a different action. So I think there are things that weren't included, but at this point, I don't think we have any cuts to our priorities. I'll go back and relook at those, but I don't see any cuts um, that I, there may be one to the kids uh, care program, but that was just on one side. So we still are in the game. It's okay. just uh, yet to be played out. Any other questions for Becky today? Commissioner Skates. Thank you, Chair. Um, so just to, to follow up on Commissioner Brevey's question, I mean, what exactly are uh, you as our lobby is doing to um, to make sure that um, 
some of these legislative priorities are being followed through, especially on appropriations. I mean, if uh, we're talking about <clears throat> these budget cuts that um, seem to be on the way, perhaps uh, for another push for the income tax cut, um, that's obviously going to leave the state budget without the resources to fund a lot of our priorities. So I just wonder what active measures are we taking other than just um, observing to uh, make sure that our uh, representatives and legislators understand that, um, that this is a, a deep priority for us and, and that I think a, a fairly good argument can be made that there is no actual surplus, that they still uh, owe a decent amount of money and promises to uh, to schools, to counties, to cities, uh, to roads, etc. cetera. Um, so, so where are we in this fight? Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, we started right off uh, in January with the new members uh, and uh, representatives of the county came down to Lansing. We met with the new members to talk about our priorities, that revenue sharing, uh, that the, the, uh, our pilot project, some of these items, we gave them a list of our priorities, talked about them. That was followed up by a legislative breakfast of which we had to, uh, again, outline our legislative priorities. And then following that, we have been having uh, individual and group meetings about specific priorities. For example, yesterday we had a, a very good meeting with virtually all the members of our delegation that sit on appropriations to talk about those key issues that are important to us. Uh, we are in a great spot that we have Senator Hildebrand, who's Chair of Appropriations, Senator McGregor, uh, Representative Affendulis, Representative Verhulen. They are, um, they, they understand our priorities. Representative Verhulen is Chair of the General Government. He knows that revenue sharing is important to Kent County. It's vital. So it's, it's, it's a combination of some group meetings as well as individual one-on-one -on -one with our key legislators so that they understand our priorities. And as we're looking at these cuts, there are some cuts that are just unacceptable to us. Revenue sharing, uh, some of these other issues in the HHS budget dealing with the, uh, the $8 million cut to administrative fee. Senator McGregor, I know, was directly responsible to the restoration of that, uh, which is key. So we'll continue to work with them. But it is very much one-on-one -on -one conversations with our legislators throughout this process. Thanks. Any other questions for Becky? All right. Thanks so much Thank for making you. the drive over. Appreciate it. All right. Next up, item four. Roger, come up to give us a parks update. <laughs> So, pleased to be at this committee doing this presentation. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Sure. Um, so you have a, a map of Kent County Park locations, and one thing that sets uh, Kent County parks <coughs> differently than uh, other park system, uh, other county park systems, is the geographic balance. Um, we also operate um, the we we own the largest piece of park land in the city of Kentwood, Wyoming, Walker, and the second largest piece in the city of Grand Rapids. We are the park system for many of the townships that don't have park systems. Um, Kent County Parks is the best melting pot of people within Kent County, and Millennium Parks is the single best location as a melting pot. We are different than uh, city park systems in that we have the, uh, we sort of do the flora, fauna, and natural areas while they do the recreation. We don't do softball leagues, we don't do tennis lessons, uh, we don't have basketball. We do have some basketball courts, we do have some tennis courts in some of our parks, but recreation is not our main focus. We do 1,900 reservations within the park system. Those are picnic reservations. That's not campground. That's not golf. That's, uh, we do more uh, picnic reservations than any system I'm aware of. We do a new master plan every five years. It's required by the DNR if we choose to go after DNR grants. And that is our lifeblood in terms of uh, acquisition. and. Uh, and development. The park system started in 1924. It was uh, done at the request of the uh, people of Kent County. It was done a petition to the county commission at the time. Gordon Park was the first park. 
So your trivia question is where is Gordon Park? And it is uh, halfway between uh, Cedar Springs and Sand Lake. There was a surge in land acquisition at that time. And Townsend Park and Fallsburg, Johnson Park were all purchased in the, in the 20s and developed in the late 20s and 30s. So the first 14 years of the park system uh, is when the, when the core of the system was developed and when there was a lot of land acquisition. And without that land acquisition, we re really wouldn't have had the parks that we talk about, that I talk about, uh, um, until maybe Millennium Park came along. So for the next 60 years, uh, the park system depended on on uh, tax reverted properties and land donations to actually get the parks we have. So Dwight Liddell, Brewer, Dutton, Lamoureux, Rogue River, Seedman, Pickerel, Palmer Park were all, were all donated or tax reverted properties. In the late 1997-98, uh, 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 we've really put, put together a land acquisition <coughs> development uh, account and started going out and buying land with a purpose. We know from, from these uh, five-year plans that we were doing, we had major gaps in geographic locations, so we, we looked at solving those, and we did. Back in 1968, the master plan said we should have a park system of 14,400 acres. That was reduced down to 10,000 acres. It was reduced again. And uh, in 1997-98 uh, was when the real master planning that got some traction started to take shape. Um, the board adopted a 7,500-acre goal in 2002, along with a quarter mill, the equivalent of a quarter mill of funding. And today we're at 6,828 acres, 38 uh, park and green space locations and four regional trails of 40 miles. Our strength uh, lies in regional parks. So some of the parks we have are, if we were to snap our fingers and create a new uh, county park system today, we wouldn't have parks that are two or three or, or 25 acres. We would look at, at creating regional parks that are 200 <coughs> acres or more. So we are the main player in regional parks in Kent County. Ada Township and Grand Rapids Township are the two other entities that have parks larger than 200 acres. And uh, fair to say that Kent County Parks <coughs> played a role in both of those. If you were to look at uh, regional park land, national guidelines, uh, you can see by the slide where Kent County sits. Kent County, Ottawa County, and Oakland County all have about the same number of acres, but it's the population of each county that makes the uh, uh, acres per thousand look different. So Ottawa, Ottawa County has done uh, quite a bit of land acquisition over the last few years. Oakland County um, really relies on, on um, state land or, or metro parks. What this does show, though, is Kent County residents do have the same activities that Oakland County or Ottawa County does, but fewer acres to play in. In terms of per capita funding and park operations, Kent, Ottawa, and Oakland comparisons again. In terms of uh, grant funding, and this is for parks, um, you can see we rely heavily on acquisition dollars. 
development dollars, if we were to put trail funding in that mix, uh, we'd add another uh, about $5 million in development money with trail grants. So in the past five years, we've acquired 221 acres. Um, you can uh, primarily grant funded. Once we absorb the hazy cloud grants that are have been awarded or are in process, the uh, the pie chart will look significantly different with DNR and private money picking up most of that. operations funding um, so it used to be that uh, operationally we were we were as low as 29 percent we now about 45 percent self-funded those fees come from from the uh, reservations from the golf course from the campground from Millennium real quick can I jump in what, what what's your total budget about five point Three million. Okay, cool. Somewhere in there. In the yeah. Area. Just need to know percentages of what. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Uh, just there comparison with where John Ball was funded in '15 in the county park system. So current pl uh, master plan. Um, we do we do survey works several different ways that establishes the goals and the objectives and creates the five-year plan. I think uh, what we are doing is what the people have indicated that they, they want us to do. We're preserving the natural areas. We're connecting the parks and communities with our trails. Um, we'll be upgrading restrooms forever. <laughs> and. Uh, adding to existing parks. So out of the action items uh, in our last master plan, we've, or current master plan, we've, community, we've completed 30 of them. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, main areas of success have been the volunteer services. The trail and the trailheads were part of the last um, grand action report. We're doing that. Um, certainly the Meadows project at Millennium Park was, uh, it, it was a huge project for us. Our, our challenge is land acquisition continues to be the challenge and where the funding comes from. Regional trail connections, we're coming up on in the next couple of years. We hope to have our portion of the regional network done. So looking ahead, sustainable funding is, is uh, a likely theme in the next master plan. Aging facilities always. You know, we have a system that dates back to the 1920s and 1930s. Not many uh, county park systems have that. Uh, finishing up the trails. Envisioning the future of each park. This is hazy cloud. And uh, you will see uh, we will be doing a, uh, the acquisition here, hopefully this year, maybe early next year, on the grant that has been awarded. And uh, then there's one more grant after that that is in the works right now. Focusing on the regional parks, and, and this is one of those where if we, if we buy, so we don't have to go out and buy all brand new park acres. If we buy 60 acres and add it to Millennium, we added 60 acres of regional parkland. If we go out and buy 60 acres and add it to Townsend, Townsend Park is in a regional park. It's not, it's, it's 144 acres. So if we buy 60 acres to that, then we just have 204 acres of regional parkland. We created a regional park where there wasn't a regional park. So sustainable funding is, is uh, another 
issue we'll be looking at in the, in the next plan. We've got two legs of the stool and a third leg that has multiple aging facilities. Again, we we're dealing with facilities that date back to the 20s and the 30s. Uh, we do have to do another round of play, playground replacements. The, the standards on the replacement and the safety factors change over time also as our uh, playgrounds age out. So we try to do a playground a year. Again, trails, trails, trails. People love their trails. Uh, this is Hazy Cloud. So um, we've digested one acquisition about 10 years ago. We have one coming up and we'll have one in another year or two. The idea is that this goes from a small park to a regional park and the grand plan is to uh, connect the new Hazy Cloud to Roselle Park, which is an Ada Township Park by a uh, bridge over the Grand River. So upcoming needs and issues, uh, more public outreach, providing better access. Yes, we have the land and now we have to uh, provide access to it and uh, creating a fund for trail resurfacing. So currently with the um, regional parks, we're at 64% of the lowest national standard. Um, we do have a great history of securing grant matches when we have the local match. And uh, I guess one of the you know, one of the things with parkland, it, it is part of the infrastructure of the community. So as, as roads get built and widened and schools and are built and grow, so does parkland. And we, we do compete with the builders and the developers. Uh, for the same land. So, any questions? Yes? Who? Oh, Commissioner Cordick. Thank you, Chair. First of all, thanks for the presentation. I was here mm -hmm. at Finance and heard it as well, and uh, thank you to Commissioner Bolter for, for bringing you here so everyone on this committee could hear it as well. So in 2002, I was on that commission back then along with Commissioner Bonk, and uh, you know we did say our goal was to spend a quarter of a mil a year in acquisition how long did we do that and when did that end the last uh, funding to that account well I never reached a quarter of a mil ever but I remember it, back it, in 2001 two three and four we were spending a lot that, of money that, on there was and that that was um, um, so there was 2000 to 2002 three and then the that was four, Millennium Park basically yeah and and then um, 2004 was the last funding of, of the land acquisition account. Okay. And then uh, I saw that, okay. State land, we have not even measurable. Why is that? We have, there's state game areas, but those are different than recreation areas. And um, it's just the way it's played out. The, uh, so the only state park in Kent County is White Pine Trail. Wow. And we have, and that is a priority from the state, and that would be what up to our state legislators to, to bring some of that money and, and those parks yeah. here, right? So that's who we would need to work on in order yeah. to get some sort and of. And I, I don't Because know. I look at Oakland County, which is you know similar to us, and they have all kinds of state parks. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Ottawa County, which is much, and I get that because they're on the lakeshore, mm -hmm. so that makes sense. But to see zero or not even one little park yeah, is sort of. It's the White Pine Trail is the state park. That's the only one. Wow. Okay. And then finally, uh, the land acquisition as a priority. Um, I, there's a lot of commissioners I think that uh, think that is a priority. So maybe that's something that we need to talk about into the future to try to bump that up a little bit. But thank you for your work and the way that you manage our parks. I think people are very happy with the product that we have now, uh, and that's a reflection on you and your department. Thank you very much. And the park staff. I said in your department. Okay. okay. Commissioner Melton. Thank you. I, I too heard you at the Finance Committee, so I'm thrilled that you're back again because it's always nicer to 
for me anyway, to be reminded of things. I did have a couple questions. One is when you talk about um, volunteers for your parks, um, I'm, I don't know what kind of a system you use, uh, but I know in Kentwood when they first put in the uh, bike path that starts in Princeton neighborhood and goes, well, it only went as far as um, uh, Wing Avenue. Mm -hmm. Now they've expanded in different ways. Um, they had to become very creative to figure out how are we going to maintain these. And they've actually started some biking clubs that do, do a beautiful job. So I, you know, I'm just sharing that information with you. I don't know, maybe you probably have your own system in, but it has not become, it is no longer a huge problem trying to find people to keep up with uh, monitoring the parks. And, and then you talk about playgrounds needing um, be upgraded this was another thing that the city kind of came together with the schools in the neighborhoods this is when um, Chief Matice was uh, the chief of police in Kentwood and he started this neighborhood fun um, or a group if you will and some of our our local parks were um, done in a weekend um, all of the leg work was done and then they it's kind of like a habitat for humanity instead of building a house we built playgrounds and it's been very successful uh, again just parting mm. information I don't know if that's something that can be done at the county level I, I don't know the transition between city and county well enough to say but um, uh, I, I think you would find many people interested in, in helping where they could so we, we have a um, volunteer coordinator that's a part-time position uh, in the department and um, she coordinates about 10,000 hours of vo volunteer hours a year and uh, she's pretty much maxed out in her ability to manage that and we do it, um, we'll do large group projects on a Saturday or on a, uh, a one-time deal or we have other people that want to do something weekly um, or on a regular basis and we let them, we try to meet people where they want to be. So if they want to do a project in Pickerel, we don't send them to Caledonia. Okay. Uh, we let them, we find projects for them. Okay, and then just to piggyback that, I went to a breakfast with um, Commissioner um, Jones. Diane Jones. Jones. <laughs> Thank you. Um, at for Parks and Rec at the Crack Center, and they had a group of kids that came out they called the Dirty Dogs. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar? Oh, yeah. What a marvelous, wonderful uh, idea that this woman put together. It's 150 strong of students, and they had them all the way on bicycles that were like bicycles down to those balance bikes. I, I think the youngest there was three and a half. And they, um, they not only then go out and exercise and do all of these things, but they actually um, do clean up and care of uh, Lamar Park, I think was the one that they uh, uh, the Luton. Luton Park. Um, but they also do go to a couple others. And I thought if we could somehow uh, capitalize on that kind of energy, I mean, there's, there's your workforce and they, you know, their back doesn't, yeah. them at the end of the day like mine does so uh, it was fascinating to listen to what they do so so Luton Park is is really our mountain biking park um, and it's east of Rockford on 10 mile and um, so the dirt dogs are the group of little kids right, and older kids um, and we worked with them to create the relationship to use Luton Park and uh, work on the trails there. Commissioner Yes, first a comment, I get into many of the parks on a pretty regular basis and I congratulate you for a great job and well-run park system. But with that said, what other communities would we be ranked with and uh, of similar size and then who would we emulate if you were to pick uh, another parks program in around you know, the Midwest? Well, I, you know, within the state, I think Ottawa and Oakland are, would be who we would be compared with. Um, and it's interesting because there are, in, in terms of emulating, um, there are other models 
around the country of regional parks. And uh, maybe the only, the closest thing we have in the state of Michigan is uh, here on Clinton Metro Parks over in southeast Michigan. And that's a regional system that extends beyond the county boundaries. Um, you know, there's a, there's a yearly meeting of, I'll call it the bigs of the bigs, um, and it moves around the country, um, and it's um, special district park forum, and special district is sort of means they have a millage. Um, but it is who I started looking, uh, going to those meetings and looking to to see see how things are done and who does what. And uh, you know, the park system is is where county taxpayers meet county government in a good way. You know, it's it's you need the sheriff's department, but generally you're not having a good time. <laughs> You know, the health department is somewhat invisible, even though it's critical. And uh, um, so it's, it's where the public has the interface. And a lot of times, the parks department is, is that department that, that, that the public knows. Um, so you go to a lot, of metro place, a lot of metro areas around the country, and you will see the regional park districts. And those are the ones that I am with. Thank you. Chair Bukowski. Yeah, um, definitely want to echo the thanks uh, for your, you and your team and staff's hard work keeping our parks um, in best condition possible within our um, fiscal constraints. Um, also to your commitment for accessibility um, and working with uh, people at my shop uh, between or during the day mm -hmm. at Disability Advocates. So thank you for that. Um, Two quick questions relative to um, do you, in the city of Grand Rapids, one of the big measurements is distance to the parks and purchasing land so that people are at most like a quarter mile walk or something. Um, the challenge with our parks is too many of them, you can't get there from here um, unless you're driving. In my family, we do Seedman, Pickerel Lake, Townsend quite often, and we're driving every time so do you measure distance from folks or is that just not a, a metric for regional parks I um, I think um, um, you know distance in terms of miles no uh, having a regional balance of parkland yes and um, you know when, when you're when part of your mission is having unique natural areas um, operating in a metro area uh, doesn't mean that you go into the heart of the city either. So um, we know we have a good balance of land at this point and it's, it's adding to that. It's not finding a point that's X number of miles away from a certain place. Right. Yeah, I mean, just following up on Commissioner Womack's comment or questions um, at finance that, you know, he, he asked about, and it was good to learn the number of passes that are given for Millennium Park. However, the, the challenge with Millennium Park is there, there's no transit service there except for right. GO Bus for people with disabilities. I'm not at all suggesting a bus route to Millennium Park, <laughs> um, but, but there has to be a transit solution that, that may not be a bus route. Um, then, like looking at Hazy Cloud, um, what what are the, the the what's the development budget? To you know, I mean, there seem to be a bunch of things sketched out on that map um, that you showed us, and how much of those development costs are in the budget, and how much are on the to be raised column? So, how long will it take to actually develop what we hope to do there? I hope what we plan to do there. I, so what you saw as a graphic is, is merely a conceptual master plan that can change easily. Right. Um, it's really based on uh, on uh, you know what the land shows us to do. I'm a landscape architect by background, so we sort of look at what the land says and tells us. It's really a it, it's a trail. Uh, 
it will be a system of trails. It's, it's one of the areas where we've had a request for equestrian trails. We have one other park that does have equestrian trails and Lowell may be a third park. So there, there is a demand there. Um, the budget will really depend on length of trail and type of trail. So there's a very wide range on, on what that development may be. At this point, uh, we, we, we haven't really put the budget uh, numbers together other than to say well, this is the concept and, and go to the community. Um, there, there's a donor base there for, for Hazy Cloud and we'll see what, what that is in the future. First, first is to get the, acquire the land and then work with the development after that. So it, anytime we develop land, it's a, it's a multi-year process and to actually get to development. All right, thank you. Mr. Steck. Thank you, Chair. Most mornings I'm blessed to drive by Millennium Park on my way to work, so um, you start every morning with a warm fuzzy from me. Um, I, am, I guess I'm a little concerned as I, uh, as I reviewed some of the materials because one of the messages that appears to be there is that we may be under um, served in the acreage that we have. So uh, I did a little reading last night of the NAPA publications on that metric and suggest that it's a pretty complex analysis, not just of how many acres you have. I mean, you could say 10 acres for every thousand residents. But it's a pretty complex analysis of all the spectrum of other resources available, locations, for example, to major parks on the, mm -hmm. on the shoreline and so on. Um, how did we arrive at the, uh, the 7,500 as the target, what was that 10 years ago or whenever that was? And, uh, and, and are you suggesting that we do need to do another uh, thorough evaluation to set an appropriate goal for acreage? Well, I think the 7,500 acre goal was uh, established as something that was reasonably attainable. Okay. That really. And uh, so we knew we weren't going to be at 14,000. That's not going to happen. But 7,500 seemed to be reasonably attainable. And that's really where the number came from. And I think the next step is to really look at the quality and the type of those acres and, and uh, try to develop more regional acres versus have a park that's 44 acres. That counts, but it's different than what you can do in a regional park. So one of the other, if I might, one of the other factors I read there is this sociological shift. So people use parks differently now than they did 20 years ago. Again, having implications for what should we set as the as the target for a healthy community and the number of regional or countywide, is that part of this uh, five-year plan process? Yes, and, and, and I think clearly the use of uh, parks <coughs> have changed. If we build every softball diamond and tennis court that we were requested to build mm -hmm. 25 years ago, we'd be awash with unused land. Uh, you know, trails just, I remember seeing the rollerblader for the first time on Kent Trails and thought, well, that's pretty unique. And, you know, it's an everyday thing. Uh, so the, the use of the parkland changes significantly. It seems to me if we, if we didn't have Grand Rapids and the quality of parks they had, if we didn't have, um, even though we don't have state parks in this county, we have some pretty healthy, strong, uh, attractive state parks in the next counties over. Uh, we might arrive at one conclusion as to what we need and, um, and that we do have those might implicate what we do think is necessary. So certainly would encourage as part of that next five year project we take a look at that. Are we, are we on track or do we need to modify it? Because as you know, land acquisition is a long term process. I know. Commissioner <laughs> Brady. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, in my district, so in Gaines Township, we have Dutt and Shadyside Park and um, I'm wondering um, well, a lot of my colleagues received a note from several of the neighbors about the park, and I'm wondering if you could give us a brief background of the project at Dutton Park, um, Calvin College, Plaster Creek Stewards, their role, and also, um, you know, the benefits to this project that's proposed. So there's a um, 
Creek Improvement Water Quality Improvement Project at uh, Dutton Shady Side, and um, and the Plaster Creek, as it flows through the park and actually flows through the county, is a very turbulent creek. It, it has a very rapid cycle in terms of uh, when it rains, um, it, and the creek fills up. It's very turbulent. Does a lot of erosion. And uh, so the, the Plaster Creek stewards and Cal are part of Calvin College, and uh, they proposed a project within Dutton Shadyside. And basically is to excavate the creek bank back and create really a, uh, a table, uh, a flat area adjacent to the creek, and um, and then much shallower creek banks beyond that. And that will allow the creek bank to rise with, with uh, um, in this case, it would slow the water down and make it less turbulent, less, uh, it wouldn't erode creek banks downstream. It would give the, it'd give the creek a chance to rest, so to speak. And then um, the, so that, that's the long-term goal through the park. Um, We've gone through a lot of engineering to make sure that the, the project makes some sense, and um, we believe it does. It's, it's one of those projects that's sort of uh, painful to begin with because of some uh, tree removal, but in the long term makes, some, makes really good solid sense. But you're going to make sure that there's plenty of trees replanted and... There's a two for one whatever comes out, there's two more being planted. All right. Any other questions for Roger today? Thank you again, Roger, for being here and all you do and your staff. They're awesome. So appreciate all your work. Thank you. And to item five, Administrator's Office Performance Measurement Review, Daryl.